Our special guest this morning is Mr Bill Boness AO, Chairman and Founder of Wilbow Corporation. Bill is one of Australia's most successful yet private business identities with interests in property development, private equity and corporate finance, established during a career spanning in excess of 45 years. In his first ever in-depth interview and profile, today's discussion will explore his background in investment banking, the origins of Wilbauer Corporation, his interests both domestically and internationally, and the partial sale of his Australian property holdings in 2006. Bill, it's a pleasure sitting down with you this morning. To begin, let's open up our discussion from a macro perspective. You're undoubtedly one of Australia's most experienced property figures. Talk to me about your assessment of the current environment from both an economic perspective and also from a commercial property perspective. Rob, I think times are weird. They are not normal, there's no secret about that. The consequences of COVID, at least to me, are, are, are still to be seen. Will those consequences be global? or will they vary from uh, place to place? Then when you unload on top of that, the China situation, for example, where is it going? Whilst in principle, the vibes don't seem bad, I think it's a time to be careful, to be watching your tail, not assuming the market's going to be taking care of uh, you. Generally, trying to set yourself up for what could be, no, could be very changeable circumstances. Governments in all facets are under huge pressures. Is a government going to be the same that it has been? I just think there are all of these vagaries and wild cards floating around out there. You've been involved with property in some form or another since the 1970s, during which time you've lived through and experienced all manner of property cycles. How would you evaluate the impact of COVID on commercial property markets relative to, say, the 2008 GFC, the 97 Asian financial crisis, and even as far back as the early 80s recession? Totally different. Absolutely, totally. Almost sad to say, but I can probably go back to the 70s as well post golf when things weren't good. During most of the circumstances that you mentioned, property suffered badly. Look at the last two uh, years, bingo. Yields compressed, etc., etc., etc. It's a complete uh, turnaround. You know, at the risk of being boring, I could take you back to the 80s when some properties you literally couldn't sell. There was no market for them. I think I can argue that's the biggest single change. It's a total reverse of what past troughs, recessions, depressions, whatever, have in fact brought. Given the current circumstances Australia finds itself in with regard to closed domestic and even international borders, what's your assessment on the impact of the attractiveness as a, of Australia as a destination for capital? It depends on timing. At the moment, we're probably not bad. We're probably seen as a safish haven. Is the long term going to change? Question mark, question mark, etc. Growth, to me at least, is going to slow up here. Uh, unless migration, etc., and students come back strongly, that to me at least has the capability to be a major factor. If we keep level headed government, and some might say that's a wild card, we should continue to be a safe haven. But I don't think it's, it's as safe as it once uh, was. The events of the past 15 months have culminated in perhaps the greatest change to the ways in which people and businesses consider the use, the physical use of, of space. In your view, are these events likely to result in long-term structural changes within particular asset classes? You have to believe there has to be a, a, a chance of that. And the obvious one which, which the whole world is talking about is uh, working practices working from home, etc., etc. 
is there going to be a uh, glut of CBD buildings? Will there be a rush to smaller buildings in the burbs? Logic, at least at this stage, says to me there has to be some sort of chance of that. Am I a deep believer in that yet? No. But I think it, it really does have a high chance. Retail is changing, thanks to the web and those uh, sorts of things. I'm not brave enough to try to forecast where retail is going to go, but it's going to be a different world. Industrial is changing too, probably for the better. In fact, certainly for the better. You know, to me, they're just part of what I referred to before as vagaries that are floating around. There's been a lot of commentary recently in regard to property taxes and their inefficiencies, particularly in regard to the stamp duty v land tax debate that's been going on for several years now. What's your view and, and do you see a better system that could be implemented? Rob, I can't give you a black and white answer to that. I can criticise stamp duty, I can criticise land tax. What I'm most conscious of is that governments probably justifiably have been spending so much money, they're going to need heaps of money. They're going to get it wherever they can. If I was cynical, I'd say we'll probably end up with both stamp duty and land tax. You know, in this general context, you've got to be questioning the bringing back of death duties, estate taxes. I just think all forms of government are going to be pushing so hard to raise money that, excuse the term, it is going to be a brave new world. Very hard to, sorry, at least to me, very hard to pick. I want to explore Bill Bowness, the person. You were born in Corporu, Queensland, to a working class family with your father working as a foreman. Talk to me about your upbringing and some of the pivotal experiences that formed part of your childhood. The first seven or eight years were very normal and very good. My father had a responsible job. In that situation, we were atypical in that he had a, a company truck and we had a phone at home, which in the late 40s, early 50s was rare. He suffered probably early 50s, serious strokes, which in those days were a major matter. He couldn't work after that, couldn't speak, couldn't walk, just a sad, simple fact of life. My mother had to go out to work for the first time for years. It influenced me to the extent that without it being taken wrongly, I didn't have a, a father figure. So when I look back, I think it made me a lot more resilient, self-reliant, etc., etc., etc. What do you recall was your first part-time job? One of two, either mowing neighbours' lawns or a, a checkout chick at the local, well, it was called Brisbane Cash and Carry, but it became Wool, Woolworths. You graduated from Brisbane State High School in the 1960s. Reflecting on that time, you previous, previously said that I always considered myself lucky in that I wasn't dumb. Walk me through Bill Bowness as a student in terms of the subjects that interested you and more generally speaking, your schooling experience. Primary school was a great. Cooper State School, big, big school, been there for years. I was fortunate, I had brains and I was very good at sport, which with kids in those sort of ages gives you a certain status. I've had a stutter my whole life the education and the sport also gave me a safeguard there. They weren't going to rubbish a kid who had brains and could play cricket, football, etc., etc. So primary school I did well. Brisbane State High was a great school which I wasted 
I uh, probably because of the lack of parental control uh, and I don't mean that in a bad way it's just a fact of life I didn't study the way that I should have you mentioned I uh, graduated when I finished HSC I in fact failed the first time failed by about a mark and we asked for a remark and uh, I crept through by a mark but you know that was caused by me that was simply buggerizing around. The consequences of that were that I couldn't go near a, uh, near, near a college, near a university, etc. I went simply because I had family working there. I went to the National Bank, worked there for two years, realised that I had been terribly dumb and uh, stupid and started to grow up during those two years. I must have been doing reasonably well in that the bank suggested I go to the University of Queensland. I started going there part-time, probably three nights a week doing commerce. Because I was growing up and I realised that this was serious stuff, I reverted back to primary school status and I did very well got a Commonwealth Scholarship, which meant I was able to finish the last two years full-time. I enjoyed that very much. Uh, university was a life-changing experience. I just you know, gained so much from it in, in, in a knowledge sense, in a social sense, whatever. What attracted you to study commerce and what are the key learnings that you take away from your experience at UQ? I can't say that commerce had deep, meaningful thought. It probably flowed from the fact I'd been working for a bank for two years, you know, worrying about ledgers and basic accounting and stuff like that. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed that commercial involvement, commercial in the sense of record keeping and all of that sort of jazz. Uni did a lot for me. Uh, apart from basic knowledge, learning how the world ticks, how it can be changed, how you can use it, interpret it, etc., etc. I made a lot of friends right around the country. I probably learnt even more that what you put in, you, uh, you, uh, you would take out. Again, at the risk of sounding self-serving. Uh, the two years full-time I did very well scored very well, could have gone on to honours or a masters, but I couldn't be bothered. It was time for the real uh, world. That's what brought me to Melbourne. Um, when I graduated in, at the start of 68, I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I think I was the only graduate working for the National Bank in uh, Queensland then and uh, that's why I came south. And talk to me about why you decided to move to Melbourne, how you found the experience and, and the types of deals that you were working on in the early parts of your banking and investment banking career. Melbourne was a totally different world. As a Queenslander, the first thing that shocks you is probably the cold and the greyness you know, after 53 years here, I think Melbourne's a great city. I absolutely love it. No regrets whatsoever. In the banks in those days, uh, you served your time. You started at the bottom and worked your way up as someone uh, was eventually promoted or died or whatever. It was a long-winded process. I could see that in my belief, I couldn't go wrong, but it was going to take time. So I joined a small investment bank after a couple of years. Today they'd be called probably mortgage brokers, but on the commercial side, nothing to do with housing. Arranging finance for shopping centres and office buildings and warehouses, etc., etc. That was my introduction to real estate. What I saw, I liked. 
and I started to think this might be a future for me. While I was thinking about that, a client approached me who was a developer, who was looking for the proverbial bright young man to make things happen even more. The two partners were starting to get tired and they wanted, as I said, the proverbial bright young man. So I joined them in 71. Melbourne went through a boom, 72, 73, which made us look very good. No, it did. Before the consequences of the ALP government of 72 struck. We'd structured ourselves for bad times though, and we got through that fine. That company was sold in probably late 75, maybe mid 76. I had a value judgment to make as to whether I moved on somewhere else or whether I started up. And I decided to take the plunge and I started up in about, I think it was August 76. So in 1976, you founded your own business, Wilbo Corporation Proprietary Limited. You've mentioned there what sparked the interest in property. Tell me about how the business evolved in those early years. One of the things my previous employer had been doing to quite a staggering level really is buying tired old houses, Victorian type houses, within basically a 10k radius of the CBD, re renovating them and, uh, and uh, selling them. That's where I started, primarily because you could turn your money over much faster. But if you're going to develop an, some shops or an office building, you're probably looking at two years plus. These days it'd be three plus, but you're looking at two years plus. Whereas the small houses I could turn over at least twice a year, if things worked out really well, maybe two and a half to even three. So it was a means of ge generating, in the relatively short term, profits and uh, cash flows. I mean. I can show you houses I sold on Richmond Hill for 32,000 bucks and thought, how smart am I? It's now worth a million dollars plus. <laughs> Hindsight's wonderful. So how did you go from flipping essentially small houses into some of the small residential subdivisions that you were doing? Time. Most of the housing stuff I funded myself. As the desire grew to move into bigger stuff, I was able to find joint venture partners and uh, we'd form a partnership or a joint venture or whatever. They were primarily the partners, either substantial private people who'd got to know me over the years or who were friends of friends or um, what were around in those days before your time, finance companies of the ilk of Lensworth or Custom Credit or AGC, whatever their faults, they were very important to me back then. The business experienced strong growth over the course of the next two decades, riding the boom periods of the late 1970s, then the early bust period of the early 80s, and then the later boom periods throughout the 1980s to emerge as one of Victoria's largest greenfield developers. Talk me through how you managed to navigate this market turbulence and remain in such a solid financial position throughout the volatility. University and the banking. I'll never begrudge the fact that I am a qualified accountant. I've never practiced, but the capacity to understand the need for cash flows, profit forecasts, etc., etc and the need to stay mates with your banks, to keep them informed, not to tell them stories, all of those sorts of things. They've, even now, they've always been crucial. They're basic to me. And my staff would tell you that's still the way that we, that we do things, to know where we're going, where we've been, etc., etc. One of the things I found fascinating and extraordinarily forward-looking about your business career was the expansion of Wilbo during the 1980s onward with dedicated offices 
established in international markets including Auckland and Dallas. What opportunity did you see for international expansion and how different is it being a developer or, or an investor in New Zealand or the US? You might have to prompt me a bit further on that, but let me go back a little bit because it's relevant. I had a uh, guy called Ray Peck join me in the early 80s. He referred to a downturn in the 70s, which is true. Whilst we were selling, the Melbourne land market was lousy. But looking at the numbers, I thought it was starting to change and you could buy broadacre tracks very cheaply. And I thought the timing was right. So um, I invited Ray to join me in, I think, the early 80s, approximately then. One of the most competent developers I've met. We took a very material move into land subdivisions then. Very material. And um, again, it sounds very uh, self-serving, but the timing was, in fact, very good. Which leads on to something else. Brisbane had been going through the same thing. It was my old hometown, I still knew it well. And I formed the same view over that. So we made a like move up to Brisbane in about 85. And um, you know, we became a, a ranking land subdivider in both places reasonably quickly. Offshore is a different thing. By the mid to late 80s, we were doing very well. There's no secret about that. When I was employed between 71 and 75, the Australian dollar, believe it or not, was buying a buck 50 US, $1.50. The board very wisely decided to put some of those, mo some of those funds offshore. So we put some money into Hawaii, Los Angeles, Phoenix. So for about two years, I was going to the States about a week in six. And for a guy of 30, that was fairly telling, great experience. It also made me a great number of friends over there of my sort of vintage. Circa 85, 86, 87, because we'd been making money, I decided to put some money off uh, shore, sim simply to spread the risk, nothing involved. So I had the capability to phone up some of those mates and say, you know, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Where should I go? And they all said the same thing. Texas was then going through a thing called the savings and loan crisis possibly before your time. <laughs> Texas was in deep excretia, but they all said the same thing. Texas is still a big, strong state. Texas will come back. And they were, they were right. In the last 10, 15 years, whatever criteria you use, Texas tends to be in the top three, whether it's employment or growth or migration or whatever. New Zealand uh, was just a pure growth thing. In those days, you tended not to be able to fly straight through. You might go via New Zealand or Honolulu or that. A high-flying company in New Zealand, Chase Corporation, had a huge land portfolio and uh, they started to believe their own crap and they duly went down the, uh, the, uh, the toilet. So I stopped off over there and had, had a look at their stuff. I then sent Ray over and he had a very thorough look at it. We bought their entire portfolio, I think, on the condition that their general manager came with it. Again, a highly competent guy who I'm still friends with. New Zealand, and I'll cover it now, is a very mixed bag. It swung wildly. You would have a brilliant market for a year or two, then you literally wouldn't sell a lot. Comparable to what Victoria has gone through and will go through again, New Zealand at times was losing people. 
primarily over here, and primarily the people they didn't want to lose, being the wealthy retired and the bright young people, the market swings were breathtaking. We opened there in 89, and in 2004, before I sold, we decided that it wasn't worth it. We'd been there 15 years. That their town planning laws were becoming draconian, and uh, we just thought, no. Nah. So we sold up and came home before we sold. Do not regret it. We probably made dough there, but it was hard yards, very hard yards. In contrast, you did experience substantial and continue to experience substantial success in the Dallas market, having now developed over 5,000 lots there since 1988, and also more recently in the Houston market, where you established an office some three years ago. How different is the US system for developers as compared with here in Australia? Rob, very hard to talk about the USA as a totality. Places like California, uh, the northwest corner, the northeast corner have extremely strict town planning. You can be there for years. Texas, relatively speaking, is a free state. Australians will find it hard to believe, but talking in sweeping terms, the state of Texas has no town planning involvement. It is all city driven. You grasp that? Zero. There's no department of planning. Nothing like that. There are no state laws. It is all done at the local council level. Now, going back when we went there and when we started to do subdivisions in the late 80s, we could get something through council easily within three months. Now we factor in 12. The rules compared to what we're used to here are still lax. But there's more bureaucracy, there's more councillor questioning, etc., etc. It is still very good compared to here, but it's changed and will change even further. The state won't become involved, but the councils are becoming tougher. Despite the depressed Melbourne market in the early 1990s, you managed to continue to grow the business both locally, particularly in Brisbane, and also internationally. What I want to know is, what are some of the deals and projects you delivered during this time that you remember most fondly? I remember reading of two in particular. One was Monash Gateway and the other was Waverley Industrial Park. But what else was there during that time? Waverley Industrial Park was probably a game changer for us. I won't get the numbers right, but probably 50 acres adjacent to the corner of Wellington and Springvale Roads, close to Monash Uni, close to Glen Waverley. Back in those days, almost the demographic heart of Melbourne and becoming a very high tech centre. We bought that, we bought it, it was a big deal for us. We bought it as a joint venture with a private person, that was a catalyst for us. It, it also sort of goes back to something we were talking about before. We actually bought it in the mid to late 80s, I guess, and we subdivided it up. And the aim was to sell off enough lots to recover our cash invested, then to build out the lots, build out the rest on a pre-leased basis which uh, we did very successfully. They were leasing well to blue chip names. Then along came the early 90s downturn and going back to what we were talking about before, the value of those plummeted. I mean plummeted. Some of them probably weren't even saleable. Now, we had the fiscal balls to be able to see it through. But that to me is a classic case point I was trying to make before. We had some vacant lots left and we'd been selling them for let's say 250 bucks a square metre. During the downturn they were valued at about 75 a square metre except you couldn't sell them. There were no uh, buyers for them. 
Monash Gateway was another site out there which again reflects how markets can change. It went to auction and I think it sold for about 15 million. We bought it after the downturn that we're talking about for five. You haven't seen those sort of circumstances for a while. And before we talk about and discuss the sale of the business, uh, the Australian operations of the business in 2006, how did you go about growing the company in the early part of the 2000s? What's always been crucial to us has been staff, to get the right staff who were on the same wave uh, length, who, to use one of my favourite sayings, drink upstream from the herd, who are prepared to step outside the square and say, you know, that's been considered for that use. What say we change the use to this? Those, those sort of thoughts have been crucial to us and that takes the right staff. We made a conscious effort to grow it during the 90s and that continued through until pre-sale in 2006, particularly in this country. We look to grow uh, Melbourne and Brisbane. New Zealand, for reasons I've spoken about, was more of a question mark. I think it's fair to say in the USA we weren't as focused as we might have been. We got heavily focused in USA around the GFC, but... Um, Coming back here, probably the early to mid 90s, we decided to really kick, uh, kick things on. And that needed the uh, right staff. We also wanted to grow the non, the non residential, which we did. And the sort of things we've been talking about were examples of that Monash Gateway, etc., etc. We were always mainly considered as land people, which is a little unfair. We did CB, CBD stuff, major, commercial, major suburban commercial stuff, three or four shopping centres, neighbourhood shopping centres, but uh, they were all very successful. So fast forward to 2006 and as Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, you placed the Australian operations on the, of the company for sale on the market, which included over 5,000 residential allotments, as well as industrial and commercial holdings across Victoria and Queensland with an estimated end value of circa 1.6 billion. What prompted this decision and was it driven by the prices being paid for assets at the time, therefore of driving up the valuation of the company or did your interest in business begin to lie elsewhere? In real detail, probably none of those. I was tired and um, I thought the market was doing some weird things. I couldn't understand it. I didn't expect it to go as far as it went, but I just thought times are strange, that if you're going to quit, this might be the time possibly before your time as well. Lensworth had sold their lot portfolio a year or so privately, a year or so previously. And I watched that very closely. And in fact, we ended up using the same people that sold. I had no desire to list zero. It was probably too big for the staff to buy. While my family is very actively involved now, they had no desire to be there 12 hours a, a, a day. They were having families, etc., etc., etc. So um, I just decided that the time had in fact come. As simple as that. And uh, I thought better to do it now rather than, rather than in a, a year or two. Interestingly, the international holdings and operations of the company were not included as part of the transaction to eventual purchaser ASX-listed Brisbane-based FKP Property Group, which later became Aveo Group. Tell, talk me through the decision-making process in terms of keeping the US operations of the company separate from the Australian sale. In a structural corporate sense, it just worked. We contemplated selling Texas as, uh, as, as well. A number of the prospective buyers liked the sound of it, were excited by it. None of them got serious about it though. We didn't have a, a closed mind. We were, we were prepared to keep it. We hadn't been working it as hard as we might have. 
and we knew there was a lot of scope there. Aveo, FKP simply said no. We don't want it, it's a complication. We're a public company, etc., etc., etc. That didn't phase us. But some of the potential private buyers certainly sniffed it out, just in a very early fashion. When we went to the market, we didn't have a strong preconceived view. We were happy to keep it for the right price, we'd have sold. Following the sale of the business, you said in 2007 that you had no seller's remorse whatsoever. I just knew the time had come for something else. At the time, you expressed an interest in providing real estate finance rather than being at the property coalface, as you call it. Talk to me about what became of this something else and how you kept yourself busy in the ensuing years. We did start out simply as a means of making money in property finance, which in those days was, uh, there was a lot less, uh, lot less competition than, than there is now. We hired a former banker who I've known for years, who'd been a lender to us, and got into mezzanine lending, reasonably serious. Rates were, rates were fairly high. If you knew the game, you could handle the risk uh, factor. The risk return equation is something you'll hear me keep on, uh, keep on talking about. It's very important to us. Very simply over time, as the banks over a long period have dropped out is a bit strong, but have dropped out of uh, property, the private sector is increasingly jumped in to uh, fill that uh, shortfall. We're still doing some with carefully selected people, not so much mezzanine, more corporate, even first mortgage debt, choosing very carefully who we're dealing with, what the security is, what the risk profile is, etc., etc., etc. It's part of our profit-making structure. You know, we say we'll give X percent to lending, and that includes corporate lending. You know, we'll do corporate bonds, depending on the circumstances. Anything is possibly a bit strong, but most things that require funding, we will check out, depending on the player, the risk profile, et cetera, et cetera. You've sort of touched on it there, but this gives us an opportunity now to talk about Wilbo Corporation in its current form. Talk me through the three divisions of the business being the Australian Property Division, the Private Equity and Investments Decision, uh, Division, and then the US subsidiary Wilbo Corporation. We basically didn't want to get into direct uh, property. We would have preferred to have done it by partnership, joint venture, to be ideally backing bright young people who, like me in 76, had the uh, dream but didn't, but didn't have the uh, cash. The way the market was from 2006, the market and the banks were taking care of them. They didn't need us. Why am I making a fortune? What do I need to you? That's tended to change. And we're now doing things with what we consider to be some bright uh, people. And we're keen to do more. Uh, yeah, we do a couple of things ourselves, but it's no big deal. Relatively speaking, it's no big deal. The lending side, we've sort of covered within the constraints of risk reward the people involved, our comfort factor with them. We'll look seriously at most sorts of lending. PE, we've had a reasonably strong presence in. We're in fact expanding that. We're looking seriously and hopefully are about to conclude one, buying either a company or a major share in, uh, in a company outside of the property scene, a totally separate world. We're keen to explore those further, very keen. In fact, it goes back again to the calibre of the people you are dealing with, their beliefs, how they run things, etc., etc. 
it sounds crass or brash, I guess, but we like to think we can bring something to a, uh, to a, a partnership apart from a, a checkbook. We've seen a bit and experienced a bit and uh, the people we've dealt with so far, uh, whether it's property or PE, seem inclined to uh, come back, so that's a good. On that private equity investment side of the business, do you find that reinvigorating or refreshing and that you're not talking about property and dealing with property people every day, you're dealing with other assets and other businesses? We've got one and a half guys here who specialise in that. So to be quite frank, I'm not involved in it on a day-to-day -day basis. We've had a CEO for 11 years. That's really his scene. Yeah, I still come in. You know, I'm no longer in, in, in at 7 a.m., but I still uh, come in. Uh, they put me in the wheelchair when they need to and wheel, wheel me out to meet someone. My day-to-day -day involvement is not great. You mentioned about working to provide finance solutions for particularly younger developers. For those young developers watching or listening, what do you look for in a relationship with them? What do you want to see? A track record, enthusiasm, something else? You've got to have a track record of uh, some sort. It may not be working for yourself, but if they can show, make very clear, they've done great stuff working for someone else, and they've been the ones who have made it happen, they haven't just ridden on someone's shirt tails, that might well serve. They can't believe their own crap. They can't confuse luck with skill. They have to understand that uh, profit has two component parts, a return for taking a risk and a return on your cash in invested. I guess if I had to summarise it, uh, the last people we, we would want in any sector that we're involved in are people who have simply been taken care of by a very strong market and by our criteria are not really plugged into what they're doing. From the outset, it seems you've run a relatively conservative, albeit diversified business throughout the entirety of your career. Is that a fair assessment and what are the benefits of pursuing that sort of business model as opposed to being concentrated in one market, in one asset class? I'd say it's very fair. We've always said over the years we will take risks and that's still the case now, but they'll be calculated risks. and. Uh, at the risk of making my staff laugh, uh, there'll be a plan A, a plan B and a plan C. That if that doesn't work, what could we do, etc, etc. Back in the old days, we effectively had five profit sources. Four of them were land subdivisions in Melbourne, Brisbane, Auckland, Texas. And we had a la much larger than most people realised commercial presence here. Talking in ballpark terms, of uh, those five, two were generally doing very well. Two were doing okay, and the fifth you wondered about sometimes. But we had that geographic and product spread. Uh, that stood us in very good stance. One of the things that I'm most proud of, we made a profit every year, every single year notwithstanding depressions, recessions, etc., etc., Our banking track record is crystal clear, absolutely crystal clear. Never had trouble borrowing money. I read previously that your golden rules, as it were, for development were looking for warning signs, do not get caught with stock or debt when the music stops, and keep plenty of good old cash at hand. Today, these continue to be sound fundamentals for development. Is there anything else that you'd add to that list? On an ongoing, longer term basis, no. I mean, some of the things I just spoke about, uh, you know, not believing your own nonsense and confusing luck with skill, there's a myriad of stuff like that. If I had to make a sweeping statement, it would be to see things the way that they are. 
not the way that you want to see them. What are your proudest achievements when reflecting on your career? I'm very pleased about staff. Over the years, we've lost very few staff, very, very few. When I sold in 2006, the average longevity was about nine and a half years, which for a privately owned a property company, ain't bad. The calibre of the staff that we had, and as a corollary to that, that a number of them are now highly successful developers in their own right. You know, I'd, I'd like to think we were a very good training ground and we're all still friends. We only run on about 10 here now, but probably five of them work for me pre-2006. Happy to come back. I also enjoyed these insights of yours wherein you said, understand the economic and political scene, understand that the world changes and that interest rates can go up. Where do you, where do you see interest rates heading in the medium to, to long term? My own personal view, and I may be totally wrong, it depends upon where you're talking about. Although, of, you know, in theory, it should be global. Inflation here, does the Reserve Bank have it right? Is, is the current inflation surge? Something brief that won't stay around, etc. I don't know. USA inflation worries me more. I'm more worried about rates going up there, at least in the short term than I am here. If they go up there, the housing market will take a whack. People have been plunging into mortgages at 30-year fixed rates. Half a percent makes a hell of a difference. I can't give you a simple answer except to say the States worries me a bit more than it does here. And uh, going back to one of your questions, uh, we'll be keeping some of our powder dry in case sales do, in fact, slow rather than over there or here. A couple of quick questions to finish our discussion. No conversation or profile of yourself would be complete, complete without making mention of your substantial philanthropic activities via your family foundation, the Bonus Family Foundation. You've been very active in terms of providing funds and donations to a whole range of causes, Zoos Victoria, University of Queensland and, and so forth. Your motto is, if you have taken, you should give back. Talk to me about why giving back is so important to you. Rob, I can't give you a black and white answer. It's just a belief I've had since, since the year dot. When I started out, you know, every June 20, I'd sit down and write out some checks for a range of uh, charities. Whether it reflects my upbringing, I can't answer. UQ, as I said before, is probably a special case, but it goes way beyond that. I just think it's something that should be done, but can I sit here and say it should be done because of one, two, three, four? No, I can't, I'm sorry. Let's talk about art. You're very heavily involved throughout the art sector uh, with some of your roles, National mm -hmm. Gallery of Victoria and art space and so forth. What do you like about art? probably be a trite answer to say that it grows on uh, you. We moved into Waverley Industrial Park in the late 80s and we had some brand new walls. I still don't know why, but I said, let's buy art and stick that on the wall rather than the traditional developers' photographs and plans, etc., etc. And it grew from that. The pleasing thing was and consistent with some other comments. The staff grew to like it too. They'd walk past something and said, you paid how much for that? Why? Then a year or two later, they'd come back and say, that's starting to grow on me. I can see something there now. And that is pleasing. If we send a work off to be shown somewhere else after three months, six months, they're starting to ask, when is this coming back? Again, it's one of those things that, is there a black and white rationale to it? No. Has it grown on me? Yes. Has it become a quasi-passion? Probably. What are your key lessons in life or in business? 
remember who you are and where you came from. So in closing, where do you see the future for Australian commercial property markets? And I suppose the second part of that question is, what's the future of Wilbur Corporation? We've sort of covered that in past. I think we're in a transitory situation. We haven't even spoken about uh, super funds, their size, their capabilities, etc., etc. We canvassed briefly um, what's, what's going to be the future for CBDs, for office space, for possibly, certainly sub-regional shopping centres, maybe regional shopping centres, I don't know. Can you just draw a line and say, we are stopping? It's not necessarily our scene, but I think we would keep on going. But taking up a point I made before, make sure we've got a plan A, plan B, plan C, etc., to try to cover what could be very changeable circumstances. Easier said than done, much easier said than done. Wilbo Group is slotted to go on. There, there is no obvious reason why it can't. It's been, hopefully, well and carefully structured. We think we've got a competent staff. The family is very well entrenched in, in the sense they know what's going on, they're actively involved. They don't get an, an, an annual report once a year and live off that. They're actively involved in talks and Zoom has become a pain in the tail, but the third generation is starting to come through very early days. Time is going to tell. I mean, the simple fact is I won't be here, so it's beyond me. All that I can do is to try to set things up. What happens after that is up to them. Bill Boness, AO, one of the legends of the Australian property scene. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Rob.